reputation in the courtroom yesterday? I'm just going to ask the uh, answer the questions for the what are you expecting from Don Bain? Do you think Duffy is guilty? Well, there you go. Today's media scrum going in on day two of the Nigel Wright on the stand at the Duffy trial. And as we heard from Terry earlier, a much different tone in the defense questioning of the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff. Andrew is former Chief of Staff. Andrew is here in Toronto. Chantel is in Montreal. Bruce is in Ottawa tonight and joining us again, Jennifer Ditchburn from the Ottawa Bureau of Canadian Press. And once again, Jennifer, you were in the courtroom today, so you were witnessing that. We talked about that different tone. Tell me about the impact it was having in there. Well, yes, it definitely got a little bit prickly. Uh, it was even more captivating today, I found, the, the testimony than the day before, precisely because it had gone into this cross-examination mode. And, you know, and there were moments where oh, the defense lawyer, Donald Bain, was sort of exasperated. And, and uh, Mr. Wright, who's, you know, got a smile on a lot of the time, like he's very pleasant when he's answering the questions. His, his questions were much more clipped today. And there were times when he's clearly that smile got really stiff because he was getting annoyed clearly irritated with Donald Bain's line of questioning. All right. Well, let's talk about what was actually in the content of all that Q&A throughout today in terms, once again, of asking each of you of, uh, of what you read about today, what you saw about today, what was the most significant moment? Andrew. Uh, I don't know if I have a significant moment. I have more of an overall impression, which is that this was intensely theological, and I don't mean by that uh, Nigel Wright's uh, biblical quote. Uh, I'm talking about sort of distinctions without differences. Uh, uh, were, you, were you doing this just because you thought it was the right thing or because you were politically covering up? Well, it was probably a bit of both. Particularly, he's definitely hammering on this point of, well, Mike Duffy was forced into this. Well, he was forced into something. There's no doubt he was pressured into saying he'd done something wrong or, or made an error. There's no doubt he was initially pressured into paying back the money, though he managed to wriggle out of that. But everything else, I don't see any evidence that he was unwilling to have be put around that that uh, that he, that he'd paid his own expenses. I don't see any evidence that he had any problem with the tampering with the audit or any of the rest of it. So he, it's a very fine distinction that lawyers trying to get is if he was unwilling to do any of it, then somehow he was unwilling to do all of it, which I don't I don't buy that at all. Chantel, yeah, there was a shift in the, in the focus. Uh, Mike Duffy trying to get them to do something versus Mike Duffy forced to do something. But I did stick. Because I believe for many people looking from the outside, the biblical reference, uh, I'm doing this because I'm a good Samaritan, will probably stick, uh, but not necessarily in the way that Mr. Wright might have hoped, because it's really hard to actually jive the notion of being a good Samaritan, trying to help the public purse with encouraging people to lie uh, to the public, to the electorate, and... Uh, if you believe that, to keep your own boss in the dark as to what you are doing so, and to weave a web of deception uh, that includes so many people. Bruce, what, uh, what struck you today? Well, for me, it was the steady flow of information that um, continued to remind people who are paying attention that what really mattered here was the protection of the party, the protection of the prime minister, not the protection of the taxpayer. Everybody who was involved, and there was a very significant number of senior people who were involved in this cover-up, seemed to think that the only thing that mattered in terms of uh, making themselves whole was making the taxpayer whole. They never seemed to stop and wonder whether they were going over an ethical cliff. And, and you could sense in looking at the emails and thinking about the conversations that were recounted there, that everybody thought that they were doing what they were paid to do because nobody was telling them what the right thing to do was. And that, again, I think comes back to the Prime Minister, and I hope he is continue, continues to be asked questions about that. We're going to play one of the questions and the answers to uh, the Prime Minister in a moment. But first of all, Jennifer, from inside the room, what was the, the moment for you? Well, again, as with yesterday, it was information that came out in emails and Mr. Wright fleshing them out. And the information was really... Uh, to do with the circle of people that knew. The circle of people that knew that either the party, someone, Mr. Wright, had paid uh, Mr. Duffy's um, expenses. And so today in the emails, we saw that one email that was sent directly to the closest person in, in the government to Mr. Harper, Ray Novak, who's been with him for years and who is his current chief of staff, one email that was sent directly to him by Nigel Wright in, 20, in 2013 said, I'm sending the check. 
So, uh, and there was another email that referred to a conference call that Mr. Novak was supposed to be on with Duffy's former lawyer in which they were going to discuss the whole plan. And so I think this raises a lot of questions. Mr. Novak, through a spokesperson today, said, I never read the email and I don't know about the conference call. Uh, he was copied or sent or received a hun about 120 emails about Duffy in a two-month period. So that and also that the party lawyer had been uh, copied on emails. So we're, we're up to, you know, half a dozen people that knew that Mr. Duffy never paid. And they knew it when the story broke and they didn't really want people to know then either. So... And apparently they didn't tell the Prime Minister, because you'll remember in the first days and weeks after this, he went into Parliament and said Nigel Wright acted alone. He was the only person who knew about this. These people would have known that was untrue and apparently did not tell the Prime Minister. So that, I, I actually, on that point, I think um, we've kind of got to a, a, a moment where the Prime Minister needs to be asked, OK, you didn't know before, but you did know on this day. So why did all these cabinet ministers and MPs and spokespeople continue to say that Nigel Wright acted alone or that there were no documents? Uh, I mean, that I think we've gotten to the point where, okay, there, you didn't know about this deception, but you must have known about the deception after the 14th of May. Well, it's about that, that culture within the prime minister's office and who was telling what to whom uh, that was the basis of a question that uh, Jordan Press, one of your colleagues at Canadian Press, asked Stephen Harper yesterday. Now, you, you saw earlier in the program, Terry used a QA and a with, uh, with uh, Stephen Harper as well. This one, uh, we're going to let the, this one run in its, uh, you know, give it the full blossom here so you can hear it all, the full question and the answer, because it's very interesting when we're talking about media lines. Here it is, watch. Uh, so the court this morning uh, in Ottawa heard uh, at great lengths about the, the lengths that your staff in the Prime Minister's office went to to uh, sweep Mr. Duffy's you know, expenses under the rug, uh, to pull him from the independent audit that the Senate had ordered, to, to have the party repay some of his funds, uh, and even to develop an entire media strategy around it. Now, the other day you had said, obviously, as leader, nothing is ever going to go perfectly well. But given all that we've heard this morning uh, in public testimony, what do you think this says about the culture in your office and how much do you feel that you had a role in creating that culture? Let me be very clear once again, and I said so publicly. Um, I did not believe Mr. Duffy's expenses could be justified and I thought he should repay them. And Mr. Wright was working with Mr. Duffy to make sure he did repay them and that's what we were, t we were told was going to happen. When I found out that is not what happened, that in fact they'd been repaid by somebody else, we made that information public and I took the appropriate action against, uh, against people who were involved in that. So when we talk about media lines, politicians uh, prepare for scrums and news conferences and they have certain things they want to say almost no matter what the question is. But this is a very key question at a key time on this story and the answer really didn't go to where the question was. What do we make of that kind of dodging and weaving, Andrew? Uh, he doesn't have an answer is the short answer. This has always been the issue much more than what did the Prime Minister know and when did he know it. It's the culture is established by the person at the top, the expectations, the values, the procedures, etc. If they chose not to tell him, all of these people chose not to tell him anything what they were about, that's also part of the culture. But so is the, the lies, frankly, that they told to the rest of the public. People don't do that without some expectation that that is what their, their job is supposed to be. John Tell? Well, it's also the, the section of the answer that says, and I took action against the people involved. I'm not sure what that means. Uh, because a lot of the people involved, the people who are in these emails uh, going back and fro and who knew or who were in the loop are still very much around. I want to show you a, another clip. This goes back to 2005. Now, I know the issues were different, sponsorship case and uh, what we're witnessing here now on the, on, on the Duffy uh, Wright affair. But the question back then in 2005 was to Stephen Harper. I asked him he was the leader of the opposition, uh, that he kept increasingly sounding like he was suggesting that Paul Martin was corrupt because he wasn't answering questions um, directly that were put to him. Here's that exchange. Watch this. The impression is clearly left that your party, and then sometimes you personally, feel that he personally is corrupt. My, my difficulty with the Prime Minister at this point, Peter, is that I don't think he's been forthcoming and honest on... Uh, fairly simple questions when there appear to be contradictions. Uh, my instinct is when somebody doesn't answer, answer questions, even simple and 
fairly innocuous questions in a straightforward manner, there may be something else. As they say, what goes around comes around. But Bruce, when you listen to that. Well, I don't think that, I mean, the substance uh, that was being discussed was different, but the point is exactly the same. And I can't help but remember that the prime, this prime minister's first, I think it was his first piece of legislation, certainly it was his marquee piece of legislation was called the Accountability Act. And if anything, what we've seen is a, an attempted master class at avoiding accountability uh, in terms of what's coming out of this trial. I, I also look around the, the group of people who are familiar, and many of them are still on the public payroll. Several of them are in the Senate. Some have been promoted. Um, and that, I think, still is a question that should go to the Prime Minister. Why do you continue to believe that it, the public should be paying these people who fudged an audit, who cooperated in an effort to lie to the public and to the news media and to Parliament about what it was that actually happened? Uh, this is a very serious matter for the Prime Minister. The only person who left the government was Nigel Wright. And I was reminding myself of the language that the Prime Minister used, not immediately upon learning of what Mr. Wright did, but it took several days, let's be clear. And in that interim period, the government had spokespeople talking about what a courageous person Mr. Wright was and how he had done the taxpayer a favor. And when the Prime Minister accepted Mr. Wright's resignation, he said, I accept that Nigel believed he was acting in the public interest, but I understand the decision he has taken to resign. I want to thank him for his tremendous contribution to our government over the past two and a half years. Period. End of quotation. There was nothing in there that would allow anybody to believe that the Prime Minister was uncomfortable with the culture that existed in his office and was prepared to do anything about it. And, you know, it was a couple of months later, he then kind of changed the story, suggesting he'd fired him. And well, and, it wasn't and, a resignation. And the grounds were that he deceived him, quote unquote. Well, if the Prime Minister is to be believed on his I didn't know anything, then all of these people deceived them, but none of the other ones, to take up Bruce's point, have actually paid the price for this. Look, Look, what's what's striking about this is how un, un, how usual it is that this didn't this one scandal is the one we know about, but the culture there of just habitually lying, of putting out quote unquote media lines. I mean, the media line followed media line in this. After I mean, Bruce just read you one about you know I accepted mm -hmm. his resignation. Uh, this is that's the real root of this. Is it's not just this one incident. This this is a, a culture in our uh, in high places in our politics. Do you want in on this, Jennifer? Well, I was going to say on that point, if I were, say, John Baird or James Moore, I would be hopping mad at people in the prime minister's office for letting me go out in public and say things about the Duffy affair that turned out not to be true. And I, th I think this is pretty interesting. On the evening that the story first broke, uh, there were obviously media calls into the prime minister's office. And a key person in the prime minister's office, one of the top people um, who was in, in charge of issues management or general media strategy, wrote to Mike Duffy when he was getting the calls from the media and said, tell them that you repaid. Tell them you repaid. So even the night that the story was breaking, and this was going to become the biggest story in Canada mm -hmm. for quite a while, they were still telling him to lie. Okay, we've got to take, so. a, a, we've got to take a quick break, but Chantel, on this point, you want to uh, make one? Uh, yes, I, I actually want to make uh, a couple of points. Uh, the first uh, being that where this is worse is probably because Stephen Harper was elected on the basis of an implicit promise to fix all that, as uh, Bruce pointed out. And two, yes, it's true that it's not the same as the sponsorship scandal. None of the people that were named or by far or close to the sponsorship scandal were Martin people or Martin appointees. Every single one of the players we're hearing about uh, was handpicked by Stephen Harper. All right. Quick break now, but we'll be back with this question. The campaign has been on for almost two weeks now. What's the impact so far? All right, Andrew, Chantel, Bruce, and Jennifer all still with us. We are in the midst of a campaign, two weeks in on an 11-week campaign, and a time to assess uh, where we are at this point. Uh, let's see, who wants to start? Uh, Bruce, why don't you start? Well, I think what we know is that the race has tightened a little bit, which I think is a reminder to us all that this is uh, far from certain in terms of the outcome, and people who are speculating that, you know, the NDP was pulling away, or the Conservatives were surging, or the Liberals were out of it, I think really need to check those instincts. The other thing that stood out for me in the first couple of weeks has been the NDP trying to find its, uh, its sea legs, if you like, 
as a potential front runner. And I wrote a piece for the Globe about this tomorrow, which is really about uh, them struggling with the fact that they are loved by some Canadians when they are an underdog. But when they try to run as a front runner, uh, they run the risk of looking arrogant and old school. And I think that's something that they may need to adjust. The Globe, that, that's a paper, right? The Globe and Mail is an <laughs> online site and a great newspaper as well. Yeah, right. Chantal? Uh, I'm going to give you impressions rather than calculations. Uh, looking at uh, Justin Trudeau and Thomas Mulcair, and I did go to events that they were in uh, in uh, Montreal as I went to a Harper event earlier on in the campaign, they both seem to enjoy campaigning a hell of a lot more than Stephen Harper does. Uh, and that is striking. And the people who are actually attending uh, the events also seem, mind you, they don't have to show their passports and give their DNA to attend rallies, but they also seem to be pumped up. So I think on both sides, the debate didn't hurt either of them. And when I look at the Conservatives, they decided to call this campaign. I don't think that they uh, have had the liftoff that they expected. And, you know, if I have an image in mind when I look at their campaign, it's a big plane on a runway that is failing to take off. Jennifer. I, I kind of think of this campaign a little bit so far like going to the movies and there's a bunch of trailers and you could pay attention to the trailers or you might just be talking to your friend or eating your popcorn. I, I don't know about people out there, but here I don't see many signs. I, it kind of feels like no campaign at all. So I, I think it's a real slow start and I also think there's a, a considerable amount of risk for the Conservatives with that slow start. You realize there's only three reporters on the conservative plane right now, um, not counting ca camera operators on the plane. And so with them being the only plane in the air and all that focus on them, what happens when the Duffy trial is on? It means that most of the questions are about that and most of the stories will be about that. So I think that sort of strategy of uh, going hard the first out, right out of the gate, it might not have been the best one, especially this week. You get the last word, Andrew. Well, we're still very much in the, the phony war stage, mm -hmm. and I think we will be probably until Labor Day. They, you know, they they want to keep their powder dry for as long as possible. You are seeing them trying out different themes. The Conservatives have been pushing on the security theme to see what kind of echo, what kind of resonance they get from it. I agree with Bruce. The it's tightened a bit, I think, post debate, which shows you the importance of leaders and their personal appeal. I think uh, there does seem to be some suggestion that, that Justin Trudeau resonated well with people during that debate. The final point I'll make is the Conservatives are famously running another one of their unbelievably tightly controlled campaigns, which I think is not to their credit. It may be almost reflexive and habitual by now. But on those moments when Harper has come out from behind the bubble, during the debate I thought he came across quite well. He had a very good session a few days ago on the ISIS threat, in which I think he came across very well. Um, when they let him out of the bag, he's actually not that bad a performer. So it makes it all the more mystifying where they're so paranoid about anybody getting access to him. All right. Thank you all. Another great discussion, three nights in a row. Wow. Let's leave it at that, though, for this week.